Ready? Not bad. All right, this is MIG welding or GMAW as a lot of people should call it. Uh, this is probably one of the most commonly used welding processes for hobbyists because it's a very simple process to pick up. The machines uh, can be relatively cheap, especially get it nowadays. Uh, but because it is unlike a lot of other processes where you have two parameters that have to work together, um, I believe it makes it one of the hardest processes to learn how to do really well. Uh, and so here are my five tips uh, to improve your MIG welding. Tip number one, if you're struggling with your wire feed or your MIG welds, uh, one of the first things I always go to look at is the parts of the system and the little parts. Uh, we're talking about your liner, uh, your contact tips and your nozzle. So let's start with the liner. The liner is a part that goes inside of your gun cable that your wire runs inside of and it is sized to fit your wire pretty close. There is a little bit of a range like uh, what I have is an 030 to 035 liner in this machine. Uh, you want to take care of the liner. You don't you want to try not to bend or kink your lead real bad. Make sure that you keep your wire clean. Uh, here's a quick little thing that I do a lot of times with my machines to help kind of keep dust and debris off of my wire is I just take a little um, earplug, foam earplug, and I run it on the wire, run the wire through that, and it helps to kind of wipe any dirt or dust off of the, the wire before it goes into the guide tubes and the drive rolls. So a good way to check uh, your, to see what the condition of your liner is uh, if maybe you might need to start thinking about getting a new one uh, is to uh, first you want to go in and release your drive roll tension um, depending on what kind of machine you might have it might be done a little bit differently uh, and then next what you want to do is stretch your lead out nice and long and straight as best you can if I pull on the wire and there's still a little bit of a curve to it uh, I should be able to pull relatively easily and that's not too bad uh, but I know if I straighten my line, my lead out a little bit more, it actually gets considerably easier. And I think that's because I have a pretty good bend uh, up by the machine just from the way the wire sits. It is a good idea to pull the nozzle and the contact tip off before you do that, just to make things a little bit easier. And as always, before you do any work on your wire feeds or any welding machines, you want to disconnect the power uh, from the machine. When you're checking your liner, it's always a good idea to remove your contact tip from the gas diffuser. Uh, and since we're talking about contact tips, this is your contact tip or a contact tip style. There's lots of different styles of these, uh, depending on the manufacturer, the machine you have. Um, they are sized again, also like the liner to fit uh, the wire size in your machine. Um, I have in the past, uh, troubleshooted machines for people uh, where it was really just a simple thing as they were using the wrong contact tip either the wrong threads on the end or they had the wrong size for the wire they were using uh, this is your main electrical contact point for your wire your welding current does not get conducted to the wire until it goes through this contact tip uh, and like any other electrical connection uh, if the wire is loose inside of there or if the contact tip is loose in your gas diffuser, it's gonna cause you some difficulties and some headaches. 
contact tips do wear out and you can see how this wire is coming out of here with a curve to it. They call that the cast of the wire. Uh, and that does cause the end of the contact to, to wear out, to oval, especially on styles like this where they're threaded uh, instead of uh, held in by the nozzle, which there's different types that do different things. Uh, but the contact tips do wear out if you're uh, one of those people who can weld and weld and weld without ruining a contact tip. Um, they do wear out. They do need to be replaced every once in a while. And it's due to that cast in the wire. It wears an oval in the hole opening. So uh, you want to make sure your contact tips are in there uh, and that they are in there, in there good and snug. A good tool to have if you're going to do a lot of MIG welding or wire feed work is a pair of whelpers. Uh, or excuse me, wel MIG pliers. The whelpers are brand name. Um, but these have a little spot right in there just for grabbing on the contact tips and giving them a little twist. One of the last little parts we're going to talk about here is your nozzle. And there's a couple different styles of nozzles and this is important to know um, which type your machine uses. Uh, and there's a, some differences even between those. This particular Miller machine that I have, uh, they're just a push on um, type nozzle. Uh, kind of a standard nozzle. It is important to make sure that these are kept clean. These are not normally a consumable item, uh, but they do wear out over time. Uh, the insulation between where this screws onto the, the end, the gas diffuser end, and your nozzle uh, does break down over time, and occasionally uh, these will fall apart. Uh, if you find that there's nothing in between your contact tip and your nozzle, and your contact tip is conducting electricity, so if your contact tip's getting stuck while you're welding, uh, that's a pretty good indication that that insulation that's in there is going bad. So one other thing with your nozzle that's important to pay attention to is whether it is uh, like this style where it's nearly flush, where the contact tip is nearly flush with the end of the nozzle, or if it's the style where the contact tip sits a little further back inside the nozzle, those are more for if you're doing flux core wire feed welding uh, because you do want to run a longer stick out with the flux core. Uh, my preference for MIG welding has always been uh, these flush mount ones. With this style that it's a press on, you can actually pull out your nozzle a little bit uh, so that you can adjust it if you need to. So my next tip uh, has to do with the consumables. So if you're struggling with your machine again, uh, you want to make sure you have the right consumables in the in the machine. Uh, and when I say consumables, I'm talking about your wire and your gas primarily. Now well, those are the only two consumables. Uh, and this is a common one if people are burning through thin material, I find out a lot, is they're using the wrong size wire. Uh, common size wire for MIG uh, is 025, 030, and 035. 035 is probably the most common uh, like a lot of welding processes, you kind of size your wire based on the thickness of your material. Uh, and the, the, obviously the thinner materials, you want to be using a thinner diameter wire. It just makes it a lot easier. Um, your machine sets the amperage based on the size of the wire and how much wire it thinks is coming out. Uh, so it's important to make sure you have the right size wire. Now, now there are lots of different types of wire uh, and we're not really going to get into all of those. Uh, there's kind of two that you might want to be aware of if you're kind of a home hobbyist welder. Uh, ER70S2 and ER70S6. Now the S means that it is a solid wire. Uh, the two has to do with the amount of silica in the wire. The two are the six. Uh, with the two there's not as much so S2 wire is best used for uh, welding on clean material. Uh, that's nice without a lot of mill scale, cleaned off, ready to go. Uh, the S6 is better if you're doing a lot of like repair welding uh, on material that might have some rust on it, some mill scale, or maybe even some paint or powder coat. The S6 wire has a higher silica amount, so you're going to get more of what they call silica islands that form. They're little brown spots of silica that when they bring the contaminants to the surface of the weld. So with your gas, uh, there's really basically two types that people run. Uh, they run straight CO2. Uh, or they run a, a mixture of argon and CO2. Unless you are doing spool gun or wire feed aluminum, you are not going to be using straight argon. Uh, if you are welding on really thick material, uh, and I, when I say thick, I mean like 3 16 and above, and you want to be able to do like single pass welds, uh, then you may want to look into carbon dioxide. 
Now, carbon dioxide is going to give you a lot more penetration um, into the material, but it's also going to give you a lot more weld spatter. So there's going to be a lot more cleanup afterwards. The 7525 mix uh, is going to be better for thinner materials, you know, an eighth inch or less. It doesn't produce as much penetration, uh, but it does provide you with a little bit cleaner weld, especially if you get your machine dialed in properly. So speaking of dialing it in, the next tip for you, check on your machine settings. And your machine settings include things, uh, your wire feed speed, your voltage, and your drive roll tension, because that can have an effect on how the weld comes out. All right, so these are those two parameters that I was talking about having to get to play nice together. Uh, you have your wire feed speed, which is uh, the same as your amperage. Amperage. Um, and then you have your voltage, which is your arc length. Now your machine automatically jacks up the amperage or runs the amperage to burn the amount of wire that it thinks is coming out. That's how they're made to work. So your voltage sets your arc length. The higher the voltage, the bigger the arc length, the lower the voltage, the lower the arc length. Uh, so as you increase your wire feed speed or increase your amperage, uh, you also need to increase your voltage so that your wire doesn't start stubbing into your metal. Uh, wire feed machines are what we call constant voltage or CV machines. Uh, they want to maintain that arc length or the voltage um, as much as possible. And the reason we want to maintain the voltage is so that we can maintain our arc length because you're not perfect, I'm not perfect. Um, as you weld, you're going to move in and out a little bit. Uh, so your, your constant voltage maintains your arc length uh, for you so that you don't get huge swings uh, in your voltage. Okay, now you can kind of play with this a little bit and use it to your advantage too. Uh, if you're welding on thinner material uh, and you see that you're getting close to burning through the material, uh, you can pull your gun back a little bit and increase your, your stick out. That in turn will actually cause the weld to be a little bit cooler uh, and not burn quite through so much. All right, one of the other parameters I talked about was your drive roll tension. Uh, having your drive rolls, which you, these are your drive rolls right here, and some machines have two and some machines have four of them. Uh, this is your drive roll tension out here. Uh, so you can tighten that down or loosen it as you need to uh, to set your drive roll tension. Now, your drive roll tension should be set uh, anytime you change your liners out so you can make sure it's working properly. The, one of the ways I've always done it that's been really simple uh, is to have a little bit of wire running out of your gun. Make sure you're not part of the electrical circuit uh, so that you're not you know, touching the ground or anything like that. Uh, and then you should be able to hold this wire uh, with your bare fingers without having to squeeze super hard and stop it from coming out. And you can see here if I squeeze this and pull the trigger you can watch my drive rolls and they're spinning and they're slipping. Okay, see the wire, you can see my earplug's not moving. If I let go of the wire, how the earplug moves forward and stops, that's how this should work. So my next tip for you guys has to do with your technique. Since a lot of issues um, that people find in their welds, a lot of discontinuities or defects, uh, can be traced back to technique. Uh, and when we talk about technique, we're talking about your work angle, uh, your travel angle, your travel speed, and then any kind of manipulations that you're gonna do. So the first one, we talk about your work angle. Work angle. Make sure we don't go angel. Uh, and your work angle, uh, depending on the weld that you're doing, if you're doing a groove weld, uh, you should have about a 90 degree work angle depending on your position. Uh, for the interest of this video, we're just gonna talk about being in the flat uh, position on your table. If you're working on a, uh, a T-joint or a fillet weld or a lap joint, um, you want to have about a 45 degree work angle. So your work angle is the relationship of your wire or your electrode perpendicular to the direction of travel. Okay. Uh, the next one we're going to talk about is your travel angle. Your travel angle is parallel to the direction of travel. Uh, and in most cases, uh, you're gonna wanna be between 10 and 15 degrees. Uh, with MIG or wire feed, uh, there's a lot of debate on whether it's better to push or pull. 
Uh, my opinion is they're both really about the same. What really is important is that you don't change partway through your weld. The next one up here is your travel speed. Um, this is really hard to, to put into a term uh, that you, like a finite, you know, it should always be this. But the way I always try to do this uh, is if this is my weld puddle going along here, uh, I always try to keep my wire in this leading edge of the weld puddle. Uh, and that's how I control my weld speed. All right, the next part of this technique is your manipulation. Uh, now you can do just a straight uh, pull or a straight stringer bead uh, with, with little or no side to side mo motion and that's perfectly fine. Uh, a, another technique that I see a lot of people like to do or and I have done in the past, I don't really do it as much anymore, is kind of a modification of a stick welder technique called the whip and pause. Uh, and it's, that's where you whip forward about a half a puddle and then you pause uh, and sometimes in some cases you go back uh, about a half of what you went forward so like an eighth of your puddle uh, and then you wait till your puddle fills out and then you whip forward and come back a little bit you wait till your puddle fills out whip forward and come back uh, and then that's what a lot of people like that gives it that kind of stacked dimes look I don't particularly do this one much anymore what I kind of default to for the most part, uh, and this would still technically be considered a stringer bead, uh, is I do little curly cues or cursive E's uh, as I make my way down the weld. Uh, another technique you can do if you need to is a weave bead, and a weave bead is done with side to side motion. And again, there's lots and lots of different techniques that you can try. Um, some of the most common ones is, is just what we call a Z weave or side to side movement. Um, some people will do like a figure eight weave, okay. Uh, a really common one if you're welding out of position and again we're trying to stick to flat is what's called a box weave uh, and it's really just the same thing as a bunch of curly cues uh, but you're just doing this. Uh, one thing I, that I always find is super important regardless of the pattern or the technique that you're using or the manipulation. Uh, is you have to make it very, very consistent. Um, welding is all about consistency. The more consistent you can get with it, the better, okay? Uh, if you're doing these weaves, and for whatever reason, one of your Z's goes way off to one side, it's gonna be very evident in your weld bead. So my last tip for you guys is to get this machine dialed in and to practice. And, uh, when you're dialing your machine in, getting it to where you, you're tuning it in right where you want it, uh, it's important to only adjust one parameter at a time. Um, so, so I always like to start with my amperage first. I get it kind of set where I want it, then I start to tune in my voltage so that it jives with my wire speed and they, they play well together and I get the weld I'm looking for. Uh, so one of the things I like to do when I'm trying to get a machine dialed in uh, is I do a series of like one inch long welds uh, and I do them pretty close together uh, so that I can compare the differences and the last tips I'll give you guys is to practice. Uh, it Practice does not make perfect, practice makes permanent uh, and so the, the goal of welding is always to be as consistent uh, as you can be. I'm going to do some practicing uh, in the meantime, you guys, uh, thank you so much for tuning in. If you're liking this content, make sure you give a like, uh, send a subscribe, and share this with somebody you know, uh, or leave me a comment down below if there's a video you'd like me to do. Uh, and in the meantime, do me a favor, do yourself a favor, and go out there and build something. And scene.